Hello. So, we've been talking about extrema, local and absolute extrema, sort of in various contexts, how to find them and things. And we will encounter many circumstances where it would be helpful to know whether or not these things are actually sort of around to look for, right? Whether or not there is some absolute highest or absolute lowest value of a function sort of in the sort of segment that we want to be considering. So this idea, this question, is going to lead us to our second existence theorem for the semester, the extreme value theorem. But before we can sort of jump into that, we need to introduce an idea called the compact set. So a compact set, uh, as a sort of warning, we're going to give a definition for the compact set in this video that is sort of a sort of sufficient for the use in calculus. But if you try to look this up on the internet, it will probably make your brain melt <laughs> because a compact set is one of these very deep ideas in sort of graduate level, PhD, research level mathematics. And so if you sort of just Google the definition of a compact set, you're going to get some real craziness. Um, so I would sort of warn you against that. You're welcome to try, but just know that going in. So compact set. So we call a set compact. We say it's compact if it has two properties. One, it needs to be bounded. So when we say bounded, we think of this as being sort of a largest number, both to the right and to the left. Um, so some sort of biggest in both directions uh, values. So basically doesn't go to infinity. That's why we're sort of calling it bounded. It also needs to be closed, which for our sort of sake, we're going to be sort of saying that a set is closed if all of the intervals have all of their endpoints. Again, these are sort of definitions that are good for calculus, but are not quite the definitions you would find if you tried to look this up in other resources, most likely. So be aware if you try to, you know, randomly look up stuff, it's going to very potentially give you some crazy other definitions that maybe you don't want to be using. All right, so let's look at a few examples that we sort of have at least an idea of what we're talking about here. So if we have the set, right, this is a set builder notation, the set of all x that x is less than or equal to 5. So this is just the same as this kind of infinite ray or this interval negative infinity to 5. And it does include the endpoint 5, but this is not compact because it has no lower bound, meaning that there's no sort of number to the left that is bigger than everything in the set because the set goes to negative infinity. So another example, again, set builder notation here, all the x such that x is uh, greater than or equal to 3 and less than or equal to 7. So this would be compact. It's a nice interval. There are numbers to the left, meaning smaller. So like 2 is smaller than everything in the set. And there are numbers to the right that are bigger. So like 8 is bigger than everything in this set. And we are including both endpoints, right? 3 and 7 are both in there. So this is a compact set. This interval is not going to be compact. Specifically, right, it's bounded. I could use like negative 30 and 27. Those would be sort of farther left and further right. But it doesn't have the endpoint, right? It has this negative 22 is not included, so it's not compact. So just because like we're talking about intervals mostly, it doesn't have to be an interval. I could have multiple intervals. So this is still compact. I could pick something that is to the left of all of this. So like negative 5 is smaller than everything listed here, and 30 is bigger than everything listed here. And importantly, I have all of the endpoints. So I have this endpoint, I have 18, I have 17, I have minus 3. All of those are in there. So this is a compact set. Similarly, this piece here, again, it's bounded. I could pick something to the left and to the right. And I have this endpoint, that endpoint, that endpoint, but I don't have five, right? I'm missing one of the endpoints. So this is not a compact set, okay? So compact sets are basically, for the sake of this class, um, some sort of combination of intervals where we have all the endpoints and we're not going to infinity in either direction, okay? So with that in mind, we can introduce the extreme value theorem. So like most theorems, I'm going to give you sort of the official uh, statement of the theorem. 
but then I'll sort of translate it into more human speak so that we can sort of see what's happening. So EVT, as it's usually referred to, the extreme value theorem, says, all right, if you have F that's just, you know, from R to R, meaning a real valued function, um, and you know that it's continuous everywhere on some compact set, that's why we need to know what compact sets are, then it, ha it must attain both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum, okay? So essentially what this is saying is, is that if you have a function and you're only looking at some compact set, like some closed interval, which is usually what we're doing, then as long as F is a continuous function, on that entire span, right? It doesn't have to be continuous everywhere as long as it's continuous within the compact set we care about, then you know that it has to reach some maximum and some minimum, okay? But sort of be careful about what you're hearing here. All I'm saying is it has to have a maximum and minimum. So in particular, EVT doesn't tell us where that maximum or minimum is, just that it is somewhere, right? Just like the intermediate value theorem, right, told us that there is a place that it hits that intermediate value, but it didn't tell us where it is. EVT works the same way. It tells us that these points exist, but not where they are, okay? So to understand why this happens, um, sort of it's, again, sort of a good idea to build some geometric intuition, sort of envision what's happening. So we're gonna do a quick sort of look at a nice demonstration of why this occurs, okay? So we know that the extreme value theorem requires the function to be continuous on a compact set. Let's look at a general function to start. So how do we know that a function must attain its maximum and minimum value if it's defined on a compact set? Well, there's two things to keep in mind. First, it must be defined everywhere on the compact set meaning that we can't have any domain restrictions. So we couldn't include this x value in our set since the set wouldn't be compact. Indeed, if we did any interval that had the value x equals negative one, say the interval negative three to two, then we would have to account for the fact that our function isn't defined there, which means we would have to write it like this. Notice that the intervals here are missing an endpoint so the set is no longer compact. This will be a problem for any interval containing the x value negative one, which means any set we have can use the extreme value theorem on can't have this value included. Now, you may notice that our function doesn't actually have any absolute maximums or minimums normally. This is where the second part comes in. First, let's take a look at an actual compact set of the domain here the set negative three to two and one to three. The second thing to keep in mind is that a compact set is bounded, meaning there is a furthest left and furthest right x value. That means that the function doesn't have the room to go to an infinitely large value to the right or left because it has to stop somewhere. Indeed, if we look at only the parts of the graph that correspond to our compact set, we can see that the y values are all finite. So the fact that our set is compact means that we avoid any domain discontinuities, including any vertical asymptotes that may give the chance for the function to escape to infinity, as well as forcing the set to stop at the edges before the set has a chance to escape to infinity using n-term behavior. As a result, the function on the compact set is forced to be contained vertically, which means we have a highest y value and a lowest y value. So we can see the extreme value theorem hinges entirely on the fact that the function must be continuous and the set must be compact. But using this fact is enough to determine that a function must have both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum, information that might be otherwise very difficult to determine. All right, so what do we do? So we introduced this idea of a compact set. So in particular, we said a set is compact if it is bounded above and below, right? There's some number bigger than it uh, in the positive direction and some number that is sort of more negative that, than everything in the set, right? 
and it had to be closed, meaning that it had to include all the endpoints for each sort of segment or interval that is in that particular set, right? So again, these are sort of calculus definitions um, as opposed to what you might see if you look this stuff up, so be aware of that. Using this idea of compact sets then, we were able to state and sort of introduce this idea of the extreme value theorem, EVT. And this is one of those existence theorems that tells us that there exists a point that sort of is where the X, uh, where the F attains the maximum and there's an X value where it attains the minimum on that compact set. But it doesn't tell us where they actually are. It tells us that they exist so we can go find them, but not what the actual value might be. Okay, so that is that.